Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, where we are connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Today, we're bringing you to my hometown, all the way up to the frozen north, the Twin Cities, Minnesota, where we've got a guest, Will, today. He's uh, he's a big contributor in the local club. Yeah, and your uh, regularly scheduled co-host, Travis. But, Will, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about, about your relationship with Jason. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm Will. I'm from the Twin Cities as well as Jason. Uh, I think I met Jason just on the local social media gaming group uh, at the very start of this edition of Kill Team. I think, Jason, you had put together maybe like one Kill Team open play day at Phoenix Games way back when the edition started, and I just barely missed it. But the person at phoenix told me about you and that's what got me in touch with you and i think we met for a game and then you started the regular open play night uh with them was games at game center uh mondays and that was that's that was when was that that was like january of 2021 it was like it was sometime like early back then it was in the early days of the season launch like i pretty much jumped right into it so it was, it was very early in that yeah yeah, we've got Will on here today because he's uh, he's a great dude, he's a great player, he's traveled for events, he's helping out with some of the event stuff coming up as well, and just in general, just a great person to have in the community, and uh, you. We're, we're glad to have him here. Uh, he's been playing Legionary a bunch, making a bunch of waves with that, although, you know, no one, it's easy to not be pigeonholed in Kill Team, there's lots of places to go, but when yeah. it comes to the stories, he's got lots of stories about the the chaos legionaries yeah and uh we've got plenty of that that we're going to touch on in today's episode as well sounds good tell me since both of you are from the twin cities i'm not part of the scene tell us a little bit about the local scene because it sounds like you two have been having a great time sounds like will you're helping out doing some of the tournament organizing while jason has been busy with work yeah i've been helping out a little bit we have We've had a significant increase in the number of tournaments we've had going lately, I'd say. Because it used to be pretty much just Jason was the only event organizer. And then a friend of ours, Jamie, got on that. And now myself and Nick are involved in it. I just organized my first tournament, except it was as a sub. So it was one that our friend Nick started. And then uh, I he couldn't make it. And I had to I, I volunteered to step in and run that. So that was my first time doing that. How was that? How was the experience? How many people was, showed up? What in what, that case it was play? only in that case it was only six. Well, it was only five people showed up. One person couldn't make, say the whole day, so they showed up to say hi, uh, but didn't <laughs> play. So I ended up I ended up playing in that one, and I I ran I I I at this point I have somewhat of a reputation I think as kind of a big competitor, and I didn't want to bring that to a place where I was toing for the first time. So I ran Warp Coven. Uh, which was kind of like it was my first team, and now they're they're well. I think they're well understood to be not as good as everyone else. So I felt I felt fine playing them, and then also going hard because I also don't ever want to play someone and have them feel like oh he's not doing his best. Like I want them to feel like I'm doing my best. Just I'm maybe I played a, a faction that's not as not as competitive. Yeah, Warp Coven. I think we all understand are solidly middle of the pack with maybe some bright spots in their rules but just having six 12 wound marines without a lot of sneaky tricks or ability to play with mission actions has definitely yeah. meant that they are restricted somewhat in the current meta i will say if your opponent is not prepared for two blast attacks one of which is indirect and the other which you can just put on a flyer that will hurt say for example in this case a chaos cult in their deployment zone really badly uh so there was I got to, I I got to do that. That sounds like a story. Was that something that happened at that that tournament? Then it is, it is something we had a we had a a board where the Chaos Cult player unfortunately played twice, and the deployment zones were a little open. Um, we did do player place terrain, um, but we elected not to switch it up on that. I guess um, on that board and on that that was my third game, and just I got the I got my flying sorcerer with uh, was it flux blast on a vantage point. 
and nuked some <laughs> nuked some of the yeah. dark commune. And then I had also, you know, the the warp the warp fire sorcerer uh, out there with uh, I think it's just called Firestorm or something like that. It is but, Firestorm. Uh, it's the four up, five attacks, four up. So it's not even that good of an attack, but it's indirect and it's it's blast. So yep. you get that so, out there. For for listeners who have not seen Warp Coven ever or have forgotten the fear of Warp Coven, <laughs> their sorcerers are 13 wound, three APL models that have access to spells. One of the spells and one of the classes is Flux Blast, which is four attacks on threes, three, four rending which blast is effective two. or and blast two and blast two importantly so it's effectively a blast bolter with rending which is very very powerful especially when your model flies so that you can move nine inches onto a vantage point and dump into the d- deployment zone one yep. of the ways that i used to counter that as a pathfinder player was to just pre-space all of my models in deployment so mm-hmm. you could blast one model and then i would delete your sorcerer so that was yep. always fun and then the other one that we're talking about is firestorm which is five attacks on fours two two indirect blast two which is also one of the ways that blast one actually oh, blast, blast one, one. is a blast one okay blast one it's, so yeah. that was one of the tools that warp coven had way back when harlequins were part of the a big part of the old meta because you could dump wounds on forp invuln save models and it yeah and that was just part of their thing and you could and also other, give yourself rerolls right exactly that same sorcerer has a power that will basically give you it you take one enemy target and you yeah. basically have relentless against that target yeah. Um, so and you can spend one CP to cast twice, so you can just move, cast, cast, and blow something up. I did that round one against um, who was I? I was against the vet guard. And this was a person who was playing vet guard for the first time. This is <laughs> it was a casual tournament, um, but I did take out their sniper turn one with that. It was I had some lucky rolls. It was lucky rolls as well, but I, I that was my I felt good about that one. Well, well, you sound like a vicious tournament organizer. <laughs> <laughs> I like yeah, I can be like I mean I am. One thing about me is I I'm very polite. I'm an, I'm I would call myself a nice person to be around, but I'm also really competitive when I get on the table. So I I love I just love sort of solving the puzzle and seeing okay what can I do here what can be done here, um, and I like that kill team is it's discreet enough that you can find just okay I find the move here and I find this move here and you don't have to find long sequences of moves normally. Um, which is what I enjoy. I enjoy the shorter term thinking. Uh, so I, I enjoy setting those up and then seeing them come to action. And that's, that's, what's fun for me. And I get, I get really into it. I like, I, again, I don't like, and I don't want people to feel like, oh, he's slumming against me or anything like that. Like I want to give them my best and have a good time. Yeah. I definitely can vouch for the fact that Will is a great example of the perfect balance of being polite and fun to play against, but also being cutthroat and he'll, like, annihilate you in the game. <laughs> I feel like that's how everyone should be in the competitive scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's You want to make sure that everyone is at least... That everything is fair and above board while you're playing. Like, being clear is very useful for everyone, including yourself, because that way you're not going to get something where you thought you'd set it up but if you never talk to your opponent and be like oh this model was supposed to be in cover if you never say anything you know it could be fair that something is out of out of alignment or you know your opponent messed it up or like you messed it up on accident and then exactly you, you both, both agree and you're like okay can i just shove it back where it's supposed to be like yeah it's fine yeah but if you're not yeah. clear it can come back to bite you yeah and i, I yes i agree with that exactly and there's and one thing about it that i ran into um, and this only ever really happened once, but it was like, because visibility and cover are relative in Kill Team, which is why Kill Team is cool, because it's all about the positioning. So, like, this guy's in cover, but he's not in cover from here. So, um, you have, like, it's, I mean, having the little line laser is absolutely essential in that regard, because yes. you can say, okay, I'm in cover from this way. Because I had, I played one game once, and the um, person I was playing in said, oh, I played it as, in, like, I put this model as intended to be out of visibility. And I just... I didn't want to quite be such a stickler. We were on the clock, and I didn't want to be a stickler and say, but it's visibility from where? Like, we've got to be clear about where it's, because it's obviously not visibility from right next to it. Um, so all those things are kind of relative, and that's why the clarity is really important as much as yeah. possible. Yeah. I have bumped into spots where people say, like, oh, I'm in cover. I'm like, yes, you are in cover from where all my models are right now. And it's like, yeah, that's true. And it's like, if I move, though, and then people are like, wait, yeah. wait, 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 we were in cover. It's like, well... 
you're in cover. The statement is true. It doesn't have to remain true forever. But that is one of the hard things and one of the fun parts about getting better at Kill Team. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you're playing Legionary, Warp Coven. So you've been playing one of these teams that maybe is not great in the meta. So how do you approach the game when you're playing Warp Coven? I mean, it sounds like you did reasonably well against this cold player if you were able to get two blasts. But do you have any I... advice for any other players as a polite, sweaty player when the meta's got you down? Oh, um, like, I don't, what would I say? Do your best. You may not take the top table, uh, but just you'll get some moments that feel good. Um, I would say, so you did say I had traveled for events. I've actually only traveled for events so far. Um, I've only, I made it out to Kansas City Open. Um, it was, it was a really good time. And yeah, I did, like, I took 16th out of 48. And the only Legionaries player to do better than I did was Ben from Battle Brothers Tabletop. He took 15th out of 48. Um, so Legionaries didn't do super well. But I mean, honestly, my the games I lost were close. I mean, one of them was super close and the other felt close, you know. Um, and both of them, my opponent, like I got some plays on my opponents that they they were like, oh, man, like that might be it. But they came back because they were really good. Um, or they were already ahead and I needed that play in order to make it even. Um, so I would say if you, I didn't go into, like, I wouldn't, you know, everyone has a fantasy of, oh, I could get the golden ticket for the top table. Um, but I didn't really go in anticipating that. I just, it's like, if I could go three, two, which is what I went, I was perfectly happy with that. Um, and most, the best part was I had a really good time just because the people there were fun. And I, wish I had gotten to hang out with them more. And from what I heard, they also wish that. So that's what's got me like more than anything, more than the need to compete. Uh, just the need to like hang out and play a fun game is what makes me want to do more tournaments. Yeah. I think even when the meta is maybe not the most fun, part of the reason why we play these games is that you get to meet other like-minded people. And just the way that you're talking about being polite, but sweaty Finding yeah. other people that are also yeah. polite but sweaty. It's really fun to like vibe out with those people in person. Even it with is. like even if you're playing a matchup you don't like, I mean, it's totally fine sometimes as long as both people are having fun. Yeah. And which which is definitely doable. Because Colts, for as powerful as they are, they are still a cool team with some cool stuff going on. Yeah. Even though they can feel a little bit overwhelming if you somehow get stuck with uh, three torments on turn three. <laughs> that can probably still feel overwhelming. But yeah. Being able to play at your best. And one of those big things in tournament play that you don't get in regular play is being able to see like a part of your game improve game to game to game. Because you can yeah. say like, I fucked up on positioning this one time. Next game, I'm going to do better on this kind of positioning. And you can apply those very, very quickly. And that kind of growth is something that you kind of don't really get on short one off one off games, I think, because it's very easy to like yeah. lose track of your thoughts as you go. And being able to play in these big tournaments and applying those things, you know, even just having a goal of a positive win rate or even just one win at a big tournament, getting out to that first big tournament and seeing like 30 people, 40 people is really fun. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think that actually is the answer for our topic of the day question, which is uh, at least a part of the answer, which the question is what to do when the meta's got you down. And I think we kind of brushed over the answer, which is just stay fun no matter what because the bottom line is fun and the whole reason that we all love this game and play this game is we're there to have fun so yeah that's and that's definitely a big enough, part interestingly enough you know we are recording this right after tacoma open finished we had first place intercession second place phobos third place handy the archon on an all open i think 62 person tournament so the, I think the top place in cult player was eighth place. And there's like a handful of Felgor players scattered throughout the, the range. So in an all open format, our big boogeyman of the, you know, the kill team last couple months has been kind of, you know, they didn't do that well, interestingly enough, in Seattle. We don't know why that is. Yeah. It could be that a lot of the deployments were really open and that allowed a lot of blasts. Maybe the players are playing cults or not as good. But for all the doom and gloom, there are plenty of examples of just go have fun and you know who knows what's going to happen because we the first place was an intercessor and that has it's been a long time since we've had an intercessor take a big tournament that 
you know, just in general. We've had Legionary because Legionary have a few more tools. Intercessor's tools are pretty flat. But the first place guy, Matt, he mentioned that just playing a, le- a Space Marine team, keeping his rules simple, let him just focus on the game. And I'm sure that is a very common yeah. thing for all the Space Marine players. As long as you don't have your models get deleted on turn one by the old boogeyman, and- Pathfinders. <laughs> yeah, it helps just when you have six operatives who are all really good and hard to kill. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, Matt ended up playing a uh, durable and rapid, I believe. So mm-hmm. tanky, tanky and fast. Yeah. It's a, oh, and one thing I like about Kill Team, even when a meta is kind of rough, I think the game is still designed such that you usually feel like you've got a shot if you're playing well. So even if it ends up, you end up getting overwhelmed, the game is kind of so, again, discreet and move to move to move that you can kind of see, okay, if this goes right, and this goes right. I might have the shot there. Whereas if I play another game, such as big 40 K, I often, if I, when I lose, I often feel like I walk away thinking, cause I'm not that good at it. Um, I walk away thinking, I don't know what I could have done different. I don't know what could have happened otherwise. Um, so I just, yeah. in the, at least in my case, kill team is a game that deludes me into thinking that I have a better shot than I do. And that makes it more fun. Yeah, having played a little bit of 10th edition now, it feels like list building is such a big part of the game. And if you don't have the models, it's like, eh, I'm probably not. Like, I played Tau against my friend's Katari focused Admech, and that just seems like, oh, his models are all terrible. <laughs> they can't really do it. I was like, I don't really, this, this is just kind of sad. But, like, that's just an inherent part of 40k that we don't have in Kill yeah. Team because our lists are semi fixed. So, even if you right. took all the wrong operatives, you still have a fighting chance. Yeah. You know, speaking of operatives, Jason, yeah. Buckle your seatbelts, listeners, because it is time for the operative showdown. Operative showdown. All right. So we've got our legionary specialist right now. So I think at the question that's on all the players' minds who are, you know, wiffle waffling between all the marks is Zinch or Nurgle and why? All right. I. For me right now, I prefer Zinch. I'm not saying Zinch is better. I think Nurgle is still a very safe choice. Um, but the simple answer is I paint my Legionaries team started as a Compendium Heretic Astartes team. I painted them to look like Emperor's children. Um, and I got, like, I can convince myself that these are a Renegade chapter that's Laneshi because they're pink. Or, but I just, playing them as Nurgle, it just felt, it just felt wrong. So I've been playing them as Zinch and Slanesh um, over the, like this year mainly. And uh, I don't know, I just like Zinch, especially because a lot of the teams we're super afraid of have a lot of AP shooting, which is just not like Nurgle's not going to help you that much with Nurgle. It doesn't give you any advantage against like eating a plasma gun, except for your leader. Your leader could eat three. No. Yeah. Your leader could eat three normal shots from a plasma gun with the damage reduction. But the four up save is also really good against an AP one. You're gonna be bet I, um, unless you really just need, uh, unless you like just need one die or something like that. Um, in general, three four ups is better than two three ups. Uh, so it's nice against AP one shooting. And I wish I had realized that earlier because I've definitely been making the wrong call a little bit. But three four ups is usually better than uh, two three ups, especially and if plus, you're in cover. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the plus for Nurgle is that if you're in cover against a plasma and they land three hits, you can make it through because your nat save is, you know, a crit save, and that does yeah. help a fair amount. Because then you're taking eight damage instead of ten, and then you're blocking the crit entirely. So that is the yeah. reason why it's playable. But four hits, you're always dead. So that yeah. one is a yeah, you can't avoid that. But yeah, I mean, Zinch does have some advantages. You want to talk about some specific advantages? I know that Zinch's mark gives you an offensive capability and range, gives you a yeah. five up lethal for one hit compared to and, Nurgle's crit save retain. Yeah. But oh, yeah, yeah, tell us a little uh, bit more about what you're doing with Zinch that you uh, like. I, or the, it sounds like, you know, maybe you're just playing it for flavor reasons right now and the love I mean, of the I'm, models is helping. Um, I did just, yeah, I was like sick of Nurgle. I was just like sick of Nurgle. Um, but, uh, I also really enjoy the tack ploy. Um, I forget what it's called, but it's the Zinch tack ploy. Just get an extra APL. Uh, Mm. so you can, like, you can get a, a pay a CP and have a four APL action. And plus, 
you know, if you also have your aspiring champion kill someone that turn, you've got another operative. They don't stack, but you've got another operative who's also essentially got four APL. So you can have two operatives with four APL in a turn, which is, you can just do, you can get a lot done. Yeah. Um, you can move dash and kill two people, which is pretty nuts. Or you can move, kill two people, do a mission action. For legionaries, at least when I play, depending on who I'm playing against, but the ones I'm, I, I'm, I'm my thing as a player is I'm always afraid of my opponent. Um, but if I'm against a horde team, I'm like always thinking, okay, how can I get, how can I kill the most models per legionary? Because then once I've started trading well, legionaries don't run out of gas as easily. Um, and uh, so if I've really like taken out some of their big heavy hitters and then they've only got the less heavy hitters left, they're going to get objectives, but my dudes are probably going to be able to take care of whatever they've got. Not always. I have lost... I have one time lost a wounded legionary to an overcharged las gun, which was just it was like, all right, that's the way it's gonna go. But uh usually if I've got two operatives left and you've got four operatives left, but they're not your best operatives, I've I can take I can take it. Um or that's been my experience. I realize there's a body economy there, but still it seems like I've been able to handle it. Um and so it's just like, can I get two kills per legionary? Per turn or something like that. So I really like that efficiency, and Zinchalat like just gives you more tools for that efficiency, especially when you've got mission actions to take care of. Yeah, I could see that. Um, when it comes down to specific operatives that you know are carrying the team, do you have a specific one? Or is it you know looking at range options outside of the melee guys? I've always looked sure. at the heavy gunner, the gunner, and the icon bearers filling somewhat similar roles. Do you have like a pair out of those three that you always take, or sometimes you I... don't take one of them? I depending on it does depend on the matchup. In general, you'll want a regular gunner, um, because it's always nice to have plasma, and having a three up plasma gun is good, um, especially with Mark of Zine Tree. Probably you have a good chance of a better chance of getting at least one crit. Um, and then I, I was just convinced. I was talking with someone on a Discord, and uh, they convinced me Melta is probably better. Um, like into the dark against intercession. So there's situations where you definitely want to melt a, which I had actually never taken the melt before. I thought the difference is so marginal and the range is so much better. But if you're in close range anyway, and against, say, a 14 wound marine, you probably want the melt a. Um, I, I only sometimes take heavy gunner. Uh, and it depends on how I'm running things. If I've got an undivided either leader or icon bearer, I'll take the heavy bolter because then you can get uh, malefic volleys for free and then you can shoot the heavy bolter twice. But I, I don't know. I feel like I mostly rely on the Reaper auto cannon, which on paper, it doesn't look as good. And then you play it and you're like, Oh, I like this. I like this a lot. That's been, and I, other people have had that experience as well. It's like people yeah. don't like it until they play it and then it gets work done. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just let me just uh for the listeners who don't know the reaper chain cannon because maybe they yeah. haven't seen or they don't remember it it's six attacks it's on chain. threes three five uh ceaseless i think ceaseless. That's, that's it right it's just it's just a, a lot of dice. A lot. yeah 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 we don't yeah. Wanna, but it's a lot of dice lot and it does now. five on a crit which is neat yeah yeah five yeah, on a crit especially with mark of zinch in comparison to the heavy bolter which is five attacks on threes four five p1 i believe mm -hmm. and heavy obviously and then the final choice would be a missile launcher which missile is launcher. i think four attacks so the lowest number of attacks out of the three weapons you can't double on threes threat, but yeah. you get two choices you get this you get a blast choice which is the frag and it's i want to say th four three five yeah. I think it's three five yeah, I, I think it's four attacks right on here. threes, blast two, three, five. And I want to say the crack is five, seven AP one on four attacks. The crack is five, seven, which is very yeah. hard to resist. Yeah. So when you're looking at the three gunner options for for chaos in general, you've got the largest single damage. You can't double fire, which is Reaper chain cannon. Yeah. You've got the middle ground, which is the frag or crack profiles with the optionality and then you can double fire if you do the heavy bolter um i think will has mentioned that he's doing it when he's taking undivided so you get a free chance to double fire how often are you actually taking the undivided leader or icon bearer then these days i don't take it that often um just because i usually you face some people with a lot of ap shooting the uh it seems like more and more teams that you will face have ap shooting um so you probably want something to protect from it. So I'm running more Zinch marks just because Undivided is more vulnerable, um, especially if it's someone I'm uh, going to be wanting to get work out of, which you need for Legionaries. 
Uh, so I tend to run either either full zinch or I'll run a zinch icon and a slanesh leader. Mm. Uh, that tends to be just because that extra inch of movement, and I also just like slanesh. I, I just I have my models painted for it. I like the way they I they're supposed to be slanesh. It's what they're calling for. Um, and Slanesh is cool. You can sap their AP. It's really nice. Um, but I do usually run an Icon Bearer. I've heard, um, again, Ben from Battle Brothers Tabletop, he was telling me he stopped running the Icon Bearer and just playing more conservative with his leader. And it seems to work out just because the other specialists are so good. Um, I will usually run an Icon Bearer with a chain sword, not with um, a Bolter. Uh, okay. and that would be matchup dependent. You can definitely do stuff with a Bolter. It's just... Um, Especially from a I, the the chainsword just it's nice having five attacks in melee and the more operatives you have with five attacks in melee it's just it's nice it feels good um, yeah. yeah I mean m- operatives with five attacks versus operatives with four or three attacks in melee it basically just means against a three attack model you basically never lose and then against four attack model there's plenty of models that were set up with four attacks on threes relentless. That are just almost always worse than a five attacks on three model. Yeah. Just because that extra attack, if you get four yeah. hits, it's really you basically always beat the three hit model. Because four attacks on threes relentless generally ends up, I think, in most cases about three hits. Rather than having run hits. enough Zangors and sorcerers with Prosper and Kopishes, I can say yeah, three hits is pretty normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really unfortunate. But it means that that fifth attack is is massive in melee. So it just allows you to parry out your opponent and then proactively do stuff, which is yeah. very, very powerful. And I'll often put um, the Malefic Blades on my gunners as well, just so that they're all, like, mostly as a deterrent, um, so that if they think, oh, they're going to get a good charge on them, uh, there's a pretty good deterrent there. Malefic Blades are really good. Yes, the Malefic Blades for, you know, players, it's five attacks on threes, three, five melee. That's two equipment points. It's like dirt cheap. Yep. You just slap it on all of your long range operatives and just turn every model on the Legionary team into a mixed threat. And it's very, very yep. powerful. Yeah. And that way yeah. you can move them up the board and not be as afraid of a charge. Though, you know, if you're up against Blooded, you're going to get eaten by an Ogren. Um, but especially if you're on Octarius and there's a door near the center of the battlefield, that's, that's not that's that's a bad situation for a Legionary player. Uh, so have, I, was, I was actually curious. I haven't seen you ever dabble in corn, but have you ever dabbled in corn? I have not. Um, I haven't tried corn, mostly just because I... Well, so my models haven't matched it, and I've always just wanted to run Slanesh with my models. I have been feeling the call of corn lately, not that, not for a rules reason or anything, but just because I've, like... As I've been going to shops, I've just been looking at the Berserker's box, and I've been thinking, I really want to paint these. I really want to make these. Um, so as opposed to branching out and becoming a more well-rounded kill team player, I might end up just building another legionaries team with some berserkers on it. And we'll see, I might start running some corn operatives in a, in a different team. I haven't figured out what I want the team to be, but I definitely want to make some berserkers. I bought the box, by the way, I finally bought the box. Oh my gosh. Um, after telling myself I wasn't going to, and then keeping looking at it. I'm sure we've all been there, but yeah. Yeah, Definitely. I, I've been, like, I've had a back burner thing to just make a World Eaters kill team for, like, at least a whole year, where I just, I, it would be another thing where I would just keep it super simple, I'd take a leader yeah. and, like, a shrive talon, and maybe a gunner, and maybe just all the rest warriors, and then it's kind of the same way that I've been thinking about in cursors lately, just focus on one little trick and really, really drill it hard, and then that would just be like the relent- perpetual aggression or whatever, where you just run into everybody with chain swords and and yeah, yeah, the shrive talent fights first, and like a melted <sighs> gunner with a with a knife, and then everyone else is just like chain swords and bolt pistols and just yeah. point blank brutality. I mean, I feel like you just if you're running mono corn, I feel like you are legally required to have a butcher on your team. Like, I feel like that is the that is you you will go to jail if you don't. Yeah, um, I, think, I think in the current meta where you are actually it looks like for the open meta at the GW opens, corn is definitely not on the table without in the dark for some percentage of the matchup. You're just going to get blasted somewhere and lose two yeah. models on turn one or two, which yeah. is basically lights out for a legionary player because will you oh, were yeah. mentioning you got to keep that two to one ratio in mind because if you can't hit it you're gonna lose right yeah yeah you've yeah. got to you, trade i mean you're gonna trade everyone's gonna trade but you've got to tr- you've got to choose your trades yeah um, do you have well, any memories of 
you know, a game that you can walk us through where a couple of your decisions were able to crawl you out of a very, very narrow win oh. percentage? Because um, I know I've had those situations, but I'm wondering, you know, for you as a legionary player, those situations, because you only have a handful of models, how did you clutch it out, especially with Zeech? I'm sure that fourth APL probably helped clutch you out of some situations. Yeah. Um, it, so I'm thinking you know, there's a play that has happened a couple times, actually. And um, once was it was against another legionaries player, our friend Jamie. And it was just like he was definitely ahead. And this happened, my aspiring champion, love this guy, killed two Marines in one turn, and then took a point. Um, so charges a dude on an objective, takes him out, Slanesh Power Sword. Um, I mean, against Marines, it's not a big deal, but against other, it can be good. I, don't know. I, I love the, I just like doing it. I like having a seven wound crit on the Power Sword. Um, what is the one, uh can you remind our listeners oh yeah, what the, the uh, slanesh slanesh power is for the power sword i mo- probably because most people you know we had shane on here last week talking about the sickening captivation but i don't actually know yeah. what the other benefits are a uh, graceful killer is the strategic ploy until the end of the turning point add one to the critical damage characteristic of friendly slanesh operatives melee weapons uh so if you've got an inspiring champion with a power sword uh they're hitting on twos Lethal five up, five attacks, five seven or four seven. Um, so they've effectively got a demon blade uh, with that, and demon blade goes up to eight, which is gross. Um, but so they can take out a marine, two crits, um, and then uh, they've got a plasma pistol that hits on two. So if another marine is within six, uh, mm-hmm. take them out too. And then if they kill someone, they get a free APL and they get an action. So cap a point. So charge on the point, kill someone, take the point, shoot someone. Um, pretty good. And then um, I did the same thing. It was against uh, Phobos at the Kansas City Open. And it was on that game because I just, we played a very intricate game of deployment. But I lost my plasma gunner to the shoot sharpshooter or the marksman on turn one, which hurt so much. And I thought, okay, there's the game. But I managed to keep myself in the game with this exact same play, the Slanesh charge, the 9-inch charge. Um, Kill a Marine. I had to spend so many rerolls because I absolutely whiffed the first roll. Uh, it, it was terrible. I spent, I think, 4 CP, but I got, I got a Reaver and a Marksman with my Aspiring Champion. And I believe I was on a point. I don't remember exactly. I don't, he might not have been on a point, but it was still... I needed to get those two Marines, and I got them. I still didn't win that game. That was turn two, and it just it didn't work out. I had another melee charge with and the other player was very very good um and so but it's still like that my opponent goes that was the point when i realized win or lose i was really gonna enjoy this game which is like the the coolest thing you can you can hear from someone i think it's like however this goes this is cool i like what you've done yeah yeah yeah. i think um one of those plays that comes up a lot is getting a double kill on a point which swings like a three-point differential and being able to find a couple of those is yeah. very very important especially when you're down uh when you're ahead you know your goal when you're ahead is really to make sure that you're spacing things out to tr- stop your opponent from scoring points like if i was yeah. ahead all of my models if i know my opponents on seek and destroy i'm trying to get my models off of my off of my objectives as much as possible and getting up, sure. getting yeah. them onto their objectives right because realistically yeah. if you can just run your models up and never keep them on objectives that's minus two points from an opponent which can yeah. be just like a disaster for some teams so yeah and, and uh, for a Marine player, it's even easier. Granted, you know, against a Marine player, you probably shouldn't be taking Eliminate Guards because you're, there's only six models. <laughs> yeah, it's not, yeah. A, not a good play. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a, yeah, that's a big lift. But you should definitely take Assassinate instead. Um, True, because it, yeah. it makes one of them very vulnerable. Um, and I will say another time, this was just, my friend Nick gave me, I was so afraid of Intercession for a while because I just had this string where as soon as they came out, I just kept losing to them. I just couldn't, I had never beaten Intercession until like a month or two before KCO. And I was just like, I just, for some reason, I can't do it. And my friend Nick was very agreeable to just help me drill Intercession. And he let me play. And one day we just played two games. And the first game, he still got me. And the second game, my anointed was charged three times and took out all three assault intercessors <laughs> on the, like when he was charged. The anointed, I mean, if you want to talk about an auto take, I think, I don't know if, but the no- I, I've just grown to absolutely love the anointed, and I, I don't think I ever play a game without it anymore. Uh, yeah. 
And I just pop the demon turn one, unless there's some absolutely critical mission action that must be done. But try to set it up that way. Just get the anointed as a demon on the field and just make your opponent deal with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Are you using a, you're using Zinch uh, anointeds though, right? Uh, depends. Yeah. If I'm running, if I'm up again, I, I mean, I love the Slanesh anointed again to get the, just the extra damage on the crit. So you're four, six, you know, rending ceaseless lethal five up, uh, five attacks, just absolute monster. Um, so you essentially have a power weapon or, um, also the extra inch of movement is pretty, I really like the extra inch of movement. Um, yeah. And for anyone who's been thinking in this podcast, like, ah, is this Lanesh one inch of movement really that good? Just look at it this way. Intercessors just got a nerf so they could not do the one inch of charge yeah. because they're like, you know what? This is too much for a whole team to have. So Slanesh gets both ends of it still. And while they may not yeah. be as good as, you know, some other options, just taking a more defensive profile. If you can yeah. find a way to send your missile into your opponent's line, that is a exactly. rule that was good enough where GW has removed that capability from the intercessors. That's exactly it. You never put it on your shooting operative, so you need to, like, uh, have more defensive. But against a, with a melee operative, who's just, like, you have your opponent has to deal with and that you're going to have on conceal until it goes off and your opponent, hope, like, if, you're, if you do it really well, your opponent might not get the chance to strike back. And also your anointed has a five up feel no pain. So they're effectively 18 wounds, which is really nice. I mean, effectively, but you know, in expectation. Um, yeah, that's it's Slanesh can really help you deliver the bomb. <laughs> but again, if I were up against, um, if I'm up against uh, Kasserkin, I think I would probably do full Slanesh team. And possibly, I think I did that against Blooded as well. Just like, mm-hmm. cause there's so many sources of AP there. I need the invuln save on everybody. You mean Zeech uh, then, right? I think yeah, Zeech. Is that what I said? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I meant Zeech. I, think. I want the four yeah. up save. Yeah, no, yeah. I would. I would. I love. I love my Slanesh boys, but I would never run Mono Slanesh unless it was just like a very casual fun match. Yeah, I think it's time for our uh, last section of the day, Jason. If you do the honors. Oh, that's right. It is time for niche tactics. Niche tactics. And I think this week I was hoping that we could maybe find some spots where we could help players learn a little bit more about scouting. I don't actually know, Will, from your travel experience in Kansas City, but do you remember any specific like scouting? Uh, counterplays. I think you mentioned against your Phobos player, you had a very intricate deployment. Did that end up leading up to a scouting bait or juke? It was, I think, you know what? The number one mistake was I let my opponent go first. That was the number one mistake because I did not realize that how, just how, so I practice against a lot of teams, but I did not practice against Phobos and that was my big loss. And I did not realize the marksman could get on the vantage point, turn one and just get a shot against my, obscured plasma gunner like i knew i knew he could ignore obscuring and i didn't realize it was that bad until it was too late and i like i convinced myself well maybe he won't be able to see him maybe he won't be able to move into a position where he can see him but he did um and they just tomed him and that was that um and you gave your opponent first turn in that case i did because you know i had the calculus of i want the second turn i think that like they're a first turn team i'm gonna want the advantage slight advantage on the second turn yeah, that exactly what you just explained is exactly what every single opponent has done to me for like every single one of the league games. People were just like, uh, you go first. And then I was like, my whole team jumps on a vantage point and nails you through obscuring. And then they throw a smoke grenade down so you can't get them back. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty no, yeah, I, 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 yeah, you have to like. I think now that I know about Phobos new bag, like, cause I think that, I think that was the first time I had played Phobos since they became good. Um, since they became playable. Um, but, uh, now that I know about it, I don't think I'll be ruined by it again. I mean, not that I was straight up ruined, but I was hurt a lot by it. Yeah. Um, Losing a plasma with no answer is definitely a big minus for the yeah. legendary. Especially oh, yeah. in an elite matchup where everyone is the same. Yeah. In yeah. like movement profiles. Yep. Yes. Uh, so yeah, then, like, I think I, cause I had done most of the games that round, it was set up well enough that you could do a recon dash and that would allow me to get um, a gunner on a vantage point and some often get a kill an important operative quickly. And I was kind of thinking I might still have a chance to do that, or I would still at least have my gunner if I didn't get to do it. But no, it didn't happen. So it was a lot of, I did a lot of recon. Um, 
And I think I set up in a way that made people think I might do infiltrate. So I didn't, yeah, I did. I think he was usually like my gunners on engage um, and behind cup, like behind visibility blocking terrain. And then um, the rest of my team on conceal usually. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, for, you know, just as an example, like at Chicago last year, I was playing against an in I was playing Hunter Clade against an intercession matchup and I deployed forward deployed my model on an objective to do I think loot. So, because I did that, we both deployed around my forward place model and we adjusted our scouting options where she set up an assault grenadier within range to move and throw a grenade. So I knew that she wanted to do it. She was on engage. But if I took first turn, I had a model that could go shoot her. So she yep, ended up yep. taking four to five, but so that she could uh, scalp the recon option for my infiltrate yep. model. Right. And then I ended up taking four to five as well so that I could go first. And I just dumped, yep. dumped a uh, barricade in the back line because I knew I wanted to go first so I could get my yeah. dude out, basically. Yeah. So there are lots of That's... layers of scouting mix-ups and now because deployment is done in three steps if you're playing a very very high level game you can start setting up for jukes i think will you mentioned you could have a model on um, engaged while having some models on concealed that could make it look like you want to do an infiltrate you can even yeah. telegraph that even further by having models out in the open right like a model out in the open can telegraph either a recon dash or placing a new barricade and yeah. that can be that can mess with people and then give being able to give yourself multiple options means that when you get to the scouting phase, after you've seen all of your deployment, even if you are the first person to place models, you still have a couple options to see if you want to go first or second or to try to play around your opponents going first or second. And it's definitely a part of the game that is kind of missed by a lot of players. Yeah, it's it's a lot of head games for the for early on in the game. Uh, and it is consequential. It is that first that first shot on open, unlike in the dark, that first play on open is a yeah. much, much bigger part of the game. And I'm sure yeah. that at Tacoma this weekend, the first place player on Intercessors probably did make good use of that first turn because having yeah. the ability to freely double fire a Doom Bolter on turn one into your opponent's back line, if you can line it up. I think he mentioned on his Goonhammer interview that the Auspex gunner is a very, very powerful piece. So just totally. having a model on the intercessor side that can ignore obscurity grant no cover and do it to anyone that he can see means that that first play if he's got a blast profile can snipe out a big chunk of your opponent's model and i'm sure the cultists yeah. from this weekend ran into that issue because the gw opens early terrain setups had a lot more kind of like open space on the deployments there was a lot of line yeah. i think a lot of cover on the line but not a lot in the deployment so you had one piece of heavy that you could use. There's a one piece of heavy in the middle and getting all of your models safely out was very difficult. So that first play probably mattered a lot. And, you know, the Alpha Strike teams, Phobos, Intercessor, and Hand of the Archon all did, you know, that was first, second, and third. And Hand of the Archon, they are really good at the Alpha Strike on turn one. Because <laughs> uh, you, um, can, you can move dash your 10 inches if you need to and then chuck a Torment Grenade and injure the whole team. Especially when people oh, are yeah. playing the thing where you're just afraid of getting blasted. So everyone's just like in a clump on your deployment. Yeah. So, you know, the hand of the Archon can throw the grenade through a wall into the clump. And if you injured everyone on the Felcourt team because they were in heavy cover, I think the game is basically over. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's pretty gnarly. <laughs> um so actually that got me thinking that that is the main alpha strike for hand of the archon right there's not like another another thing sneaking I, around i think you can well the blaster no that's the shredder the shredder five attacks on threes three four rending with basically a five attack bolter with rending and blast two that's their other alpha strike and you can do from darkness death on turn one reasonably easily into you know open boards because you can swing around the edge of a map hit the one dude from far away and then just explode the whole crew so players players so one of the things that i started doing way way back on really really open deployments is just pre-spacing all my models two inches away so that's a, a niche tactic for horde teams is just you know what anyone who's gonna get shot i'd rather one guy get shot than everyone get shot and that's not maybe not the most intuitive thing but it is it was consequential it was a big part of the warp coven players that i played against last year just having basically no options against me yeah, yeah. especially with like 
it's like you if you've played enough of the horde team you know that it is impossible to escape being shot at the beginning and then when you put them in the open you're just like i choose for you to shoot this guy instead yeah. of landing some crazy like alpha strike where you're gonna blow up half my team exactly yep, yep. um as long as i mean you don't do that against intercession squad i would say just because you're leaving too many people to hang with like an overwatch or something like that or just intercession gets so many shots and if you take them out, they still get more shots. So, like, I, yeah, that's um, interse- I, I don't know. Intercession frustrates me in that regard, just because the placing against them, they they just they're really good at shooting you. Yeah. And and then if you shoot them back, they shoot you more. Yeah, there is a cute thing that you can do with models with um, more, multiple sets of recon, where you can set up a model six inches away from cover, and yeah. then take your double recon dashes back and into cover basically so you can force your opponent to set up as if they could get these models and sure, because you yeah. have two recons you can actually s- split up and that's something that veteran guard kind of do with their barricade deployments because you can enter the breach yeah. forward but you can yeah. also do it on teams with multiple recons so pathfinders and cast can both stick out as teams where you can take a recon option select a recon option with a free model because of your mm-hmm. recon drone and your Reckon, reconter, the guy with the aspects basically. You tell someone else to move, so you can yeah. like have a guy out in the open. Your opponent can deploy as if they can shoot that model, and you can put like a really, really good model in play, like a plasma gunner on engage. And your opponent's like, "Oh, I can go get that guy." And then after they set up for the bait, you can run away, and then yeah. that puts their model in an awkward spot, which is which can be good because any wasted activation on an elite team on the first turn is yeah. crippling because you only have 18 activations compared to your opponents, you know, generally like 20, 20 to 24, or even more. So yeah. those wasted activations can really hurt. Sounds like, uh, you know, we should do some uh, light call outs for our sponsorship merch, which is still going. Right, Jason? That's true. Um, yeah, so on that note, if you haven't already joined the Discord and you've made it this far into the episode, you should definitely join the Discord. Also, if you are interested in getting your hands on just another Kill Team gauge, you should head over to the link that we've got in the Discord and use that to order it. You can get a discount code on the gauge if you join the Discord and you say the secret magic word, which this week... Is going to be anointed. <laughs> Here for it's, it. He's the uh, he's the most powerful melee operative on the on that team, unless it's the uh, psyker who just accidentally triple crits and deletes a model, or quintuple crits. Yeah, I've always know. said. Yeah, when I'm charging in, I'm like, well, you could always just instantly thwack me. Well, you give yourself malign influence. Or if the psyker gives himself malign influence, then you yeah, then it's a much greater danger well that is it for today's episode thank you all for listening and we'll see you in the discord thanks for having me thanks for coming along yeah happy to be here